Hey everybody, I'm Rick Beato, and of course you know Tim Pierce. Hello, hello. We're out here in Los Angeles where Tim lives, and we are gonna be going to the NAMM show over the next few days and doing a bunch of other things together. And Tim and I were having this interesting discussion last night that we decided that we would bring to you about rock music. I saw I saw this article, it was in some British newspaper this past week and okay. it talked about uh, saying that rock music died in 1979 after the Clash's record London Calling and, and Bruce Springsteen The River essentially discounting all music that came in the 80s and the 90s and, <laughs> and so on and so forth but we're actually here to report that it is alive and well <laughs> as is the guitar <laughs> yes. it seems to be growing from my point of view so I wouldn't agree with that article. Yeah, I think it's ridiculous. So it, let's just talk about the 80s first of all. Let's address yeah. that. So <clears throat> so in the 80s, synthesizers were obviously used sparingly in the in the late 60s and the and the 70s, but really once the the advent of the DX7 and keyboards like that started uh -huh. happening in the 80s, you had a whole many genres of what you call rock music, like The Cure or the you know, there's just so many of these 80s bands that there were that use synthesizers and guitars. Absolutely. Drum machines, things like that. Clean and dirty guitars, big gated drums. I would argue that the rock drum sound got bigger yeah. in the 80s. That's rock. Yeah. So, not just guitars. Not just guitars. Yeah. And then there was a whole, the whole genre of hair metal. Absolutely. That was massively yeah. big. Yes. And... I think that they were talking about that, that, that there was nothing. I, some of the article was talking about how, you know, there was protest music from the 60s. And once that era of music that dealt with social issues and things right. like that ended, that that was the end of rock. Well, it was probably one of the annoying things about the 80s is that image rock got bigger and bigger. And it was OK to be a rock star. Right. Whereas Led Zeppelin, they were rock stars, but it's like they weren't trying. Right. In the 80s, it was calculated. Yes. So you had White Snake and Bon Jovi. We are rock stars. We're showing it. We're doing it front and center. We're making money. We're huge. That was part of the allure. And it was okay. It was accepted. Mm -hmm. In the 90s, it was no, no longer accepted. It turned around. It turned and, around. And rock was massively big still. And it, it was credible again because yeah. Nirvana was totally credible. Yeah. Smells Like Teen Spirit wiped out that whole era in one, you know, with one brush stroke. But it was totally credible again. So... And not about money. And not about being big and being a hero. Do you think that when new metal happened in the in the early 2000s, I mean, you, you were session guitarists through all these different eras. Mm -hmm. And that that was a time when bands stopped being worldwide successes. I mean, really through grunge, grunge artists were worldwide That's true. successes. Yeah. All those 80s metals, if it was Def Leppard, the 80s metal groups, they were <clears> worldwide. <throat> they were famous worldwide. The thing is, why put pressure on a genre to last 40 years instead of 30? So the way I look at rock, if it's not a genre, it is... In any band's live performance, be it, be it Justin Timberlake or Lizzo or anybody, if you look at their performance on stage and the meter goes all the way and gets pinned, that's the rock part of their show. There'll be a heavy rock guitar, there'll be rock riffs. So now it's actually just a flavor. I think that, I think people, you could say it died as a genre, but it didn't really die as a genre. It got just got absorbed into everything else. Right. And if you don't rock when you're on stage, you don't have a good stage show. Right. If you don't have a guitar player up there, if you notice, even any of these people who do <laughs> Even if they don't songs, have guitars on the records, absolutely they have they a guitar have, player in their yeah, live shows. They're going for it. <laughs> so it's still, it's just semantics. Yeah. And sometimes journalists, they have to write, they have to get right to get paid. They have an opinion they have to put out there. Yeah. But in this particular case, we I think we know more about it than they do. And you and I in particular, and all our friends who we're gonna see this week, who are YouTubers, we reach people directly. There's no shortage of people who love guitars, distorted guitars, rock elements in music. No shortage of people.
Talk about the change in the things that you would be asked to play as a session guitarist in the 80s versus the 90s versus the 2000s. <clears throat> okay, in the 80s, there was a formula. Mm -hmm. And you would double the power guitars left and right. You would bring all your marshals. The producer would bring all his marshals. <laughs> you would pick the I love best marshals <laughs> <laughs> from all the marshals that were sitting there. <laughs> and you would record your power okay, guitars. Okay, wait. So how long would it take before you decide on what marshals you need to use? You just test each one. If you had seven, you'd test seven. Oh and you'd decide God. on number six. And if you had 12, you'd that. decide on number three. <laughs> and then you'd get somebody else to bring some more marshals the next day. Because they all sounded different. I mean, would this stuff go on for, for just hours and hours, even picking sounds, Well, right? yeah, sure. The thing is, there was no time limit. There was enough studio time available on any project that if it took a day to get the guitar sound, you took a day. If it took three hours, you take three hours. That's why those records sound so good, because yeah. people didn't compromise. And it was kind of painful at times, mm -hmm. especially when you'd show up and you'd spend a full day on the snare drum and you'd all be waiting. Oh as a guitar player, just listening to the snare. But it would literally, I remember those days yeah. when you would spend a day on the snare drum. Yeah, yeah. It's really, yeah. nowadays people, oh, it doesn't sound good, put a <clears throat> sample on it. Well, the art of that recording process has all been vetted to where everybody knows how to get a drum sound in an hour now. But right. back then it was harder. Yeah. The art of recording required, <laughs> you know, everybody was building it up from scratch and there yeah. was more mystery and allure to it. It's kind of been figured out now. Yeah. No. Okay, so tell me more about the about the formula for okay, you double the guitars. Double the guitars, there'd be clean parts, clean parts in the chorus. Mm -hmm. There'd be some special interest part in the second verse. Now that never changed. This is <laughs> And that's the same in Nashville now. I mean, if yes. if a second verse comes around and you're a guitar player on a session anywhere in the world, you've got to come up with something <laughs> unique and new. A new signature part <laughs> exactly. in the second verse. Yeah, so double guitars, high parts, you're basically filling frequencies. And I always liked hard panned left and right guitars because it left all the room in the middle for the vocal. Mm -hmm. And then you could hear the drums through the whole spectrum. I never ever can understand why somebody puts a guitar at, at three o'clock. Right. Like that. It's, so I, it makes I no always sense. just, I just like hard left, hard right, as many as you want, you know? Okay, so on sessions in the 80s, we're gonna stick with the 80s right now. All right. Um, how many times would you come in and there'd be a drum machine that you'd play to? Uh, it started to transition to where it was probably 50% of the time. Wow. Uh, out here, there was still a lot of emphasis on the drums because once uh, the, the AMS reverb and the nonlinear gate, you know, yeah. came, came along, that kind of made it sound like a drum machine. And right. you, you listen to Genesis Records and Peter Gabriel and all, and, and even when I worked with Rick Springfield, the records have that big AMS yeah. on it. And so it kind of made, it kind of turned the drum, the, the drums didn't really go away. They just, they shared the, the, the landscape with drum machines. When you would come in to a session and the drum machine, you'd hear a drum machine part, would it, it already be laid down? Yes. And you would be playing to a click. <clears throat> and then, would it be, Tim, you know what to do, or would the producer tell you what they want? It depends on the producer. I had one session where uh, it was for an actress, and it was a hip-hop producer, an early, like, urban producer. Yeah. And he basically wanted me to write a riff. Mm -hmm. And there was nothing but the drum machine and her vocal, and she was quite a famous actress. And I said, you know what? If I write this riff, I'm writing the song. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> <clears throat> you contrast that to being in, a, in the room with David Foster. And David had guitar players who were more his favorite than I was, but I did end up in a room with, with David Foster or Patrick Leonard or some of these really genius keyboard players. And they were so full of ideas that they would guide you. Oh, it needs to sound like the Beatles here. And I'll sing you a little part if you can't finish your idea. So it was, it was a combination, basically. And if they were artists, then you would, you would just, you would try an arpeggio and they would go, yeah, I like that, but change this. Mm -hmm. And your ability to actually read what they really wanted. Oh, it needs to be a little cleaner. Yeah, and if we double that, it'll be great. And if we do something underneath, it'll be great. So they were aware that it was different frequencies and different parts that would happen. There were eighth note parts and arpeggios <laughs> and more eighth note parts. <laughs> <laughs> 
and you're when you would do, riffs when you do the, the heavier guitar with yeah. the Marshalls, would you double it would be the exact same sound in both speakers? Generally, right? yes. Yeah. There were there were producers and artists who did want you to change a guitar. Okay. Because if you have a P ninety guitar on one side yeah. and a humbucker on the other side, it spreads, it spreads out the stereo. Exactly, like yeah. you've done it a million times. Yeah. yeah. So and sometimes single coils can sound really great, like a, uh, a bridge pickup on a Strat can sound great through a Marshall too, yeah, because it doesn't fill up all that bottom end and steal all that real so, estate. So sometimes you have a humbucker on one side and, a, exactly. and a, like a less yeah. ball on a Strat. And then even, what's even better if you're tracking with two guitar players, because touch has so much to do with tone, yeah. that if, if one guy's over here and one guy's over there, you're getting these little changes, things pixelating that you're not really aware of, it's changing all the time, that really brought so much life to it. You know. Did you see things starting to change in the later 80s? Did the things you were asked to do change then stylistically, or was it really <clears throat> the beginning of the 90s that things changed? Well, it, when Nirvana arrived, yep. many careers ended. <laughs> <laughs> and it, I lucked out because I was always known as the guy who could sound like the guy who came out of the garage or mm -hmm. came out of the band. The band guy, the studio guy who could sound like a band guy. Yeah. So when Nirvana arrived, I actually, it, it was great timing for me because I started to work full time at that point. Because I could kind of do that imperfect, kind of spontaneous, little less than polished thing around the edges. The reason David Foster used other guys instead of me because I wasn't quite as polished. Mm -hmm. So when Nirvana came along and the unpolished approach on a guitar So was even in the sessions that you were doing that would be that that became a thing to be, they wanted it unpolished. Exactly. Producers. Yeah. It's, they wanted it to sound like somebody who maybe was 19. Yeah. Or what didn't have total command of the instrument. And I kind of was able to, to walk that line between delivering right away, but having these unique little events happen or maybe playing the guitar a little too hard. Mm -hmm. I could sound like I was more near the beginning than <laughs> <laughs> then in the middle or at the end of a <laughs> polished career. Okay, and as far as the parts that you were asked to play, yeah, would they still be stereo guitar parts like that, or did it did things change? Did you um, you'd always have something in the chorus that would come in right up the center? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I would always try and and make the chorus go like this. Yeah, no matter what it was. And yeah. I, if you listen, you know, make it the chorus sound huge. But it was different. Not necessarily doubling. You'd have a mono guitar over here and then a different part on the other side. Right. And maybe you would double that part and things would change. It wasn't so much about, you know, Def Leppard, it's reliable. It's, right. you know, it's a wall that's reliable running down each side. This became more about the unexpected. Mm -hmm. Different parts and sounds. Okay, yeah. so grunge really happened in a short period of time though. It was pretty much over by 1995, and then okay. you had a lot of female artists that happened in the mid 90s. Yeah, and you were obviously playing in sessions then. I was, but what do you have to say about bands like Stained and Creed? Well, those are later. Well, Stained and Creed were. Uh, Stained is really new metal, even though new metal was a, was crossing. Was over that later 90s? Well, because Corn really happened be, happened in the. Er Mid nineties, yeah, okay. And Creed ninety seven, ninety eight, then Lincoln Park ninety nine. <clears throat> okay, so, so I have a complaint about that, yeah. And that's where guitar became colorless mm -hmm. because it just became this one kind of. It, then it became doubled again, right? And just this, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> and they didn't want any colorful things. They didn't want any little flowery things. Now, when you talk about female artists, that that was the heyday for me because. Mm -hmm. You, you could just paint and colors here, colors there, colors everywhere. Kind of like what Nashville became later. Yeah. Like, you know, like Lady Antebellum or whatever, just colors, you know, or Rascal Flats, colors everywhere. And that for me was, was heaven. I like Sean Colvin, stuff yeah. like that. It, it was to me the, the heyday, the, the just the, the most wonderful era for. When I think back to, to records from that time period or artists, female artists, then you know, Sarah McLaughlin's or Sean Colvin's or... Perfect, Sarah McLaughlin. Or, or even, Bill, honestly... What was that guy's name? Bill, uh, he was an amazing guitar player. Or, or even Sting's records right. that Dominique Miller did yeah. as a band member. Yeah. yeah, That you just would hear these little parts, just yeah. just tiny little parts that would come out here and there. Yeah. They'd be beautiful. Coldplay's first record, 
Amazing. Yeah. That's another story, though. Yeah. Yeah. Same thing. Just Same thing. Just colors. Beautiful colors. Let's talk about the edge, because mm -hmm. the edge is one of my favorite guitar players, and I never talk about him on this channel. Okay. All right. And I think you and I are uniquely able to talk about the edge. You're right. I think the edge is one of the most brilliant guitar players ever part player sound just a genius with sonics one of the most accurate players live and yeah. i've seen you two play many times <clears throat> yeah. and he never plays a bum note um he reinvented the guitar parts in in a way that Honestly, it became guitar orchestration. Or guitar orchestration Absolutely. in a way that people have, have abused it, and I think it's... Uh, it's still what he does. I can play an edge part, and it will solve... It'll get me out of a jam and solve a problem, and I can bend it so it doesn't sound like an edge part, and it's so familiar to everybody, they've forgotten that it's an edge part. So he reinvented guitar for songs. Talk about Edge's tone and, and the, the use of delay and things like that, and how instrumental he was in okay. reinventing that. How do you solve the three-piece problem when you're a guitar player? You can be Eddie Van Halen and be a virtuoso. Yep. In Edge's case, he chose to paint sonic landscapes. Yeah. And the delay, I think, for him was a way to add size and sort of an orchestral approach to the nakedness of being in a three-piece. That was his solution. Yeah. You have to rise to the occasion in a three-piece. Try it. It's, it's crazy. Yes. It's crazy. It's it naked. Is. Yeah. You know, so he, he, the, I think his style. Andy was, Summers before him, too, similarly. Totally, totally. Incredible. Yeah, right. Just brilliant. But The Edge, live with those effects, found a way to fill a space. Stadium. Yeah, a, a stadium. stadium. Yeah, a space and a stadium. Yeah. Call it whatever you want. Yeah. This huge thing so that he could color. He Think about this. You have the bass and drums and you have the vocal. He's the whole orchestra. Yeah. Because you have the rhythm and the bass. I can include the bass in the rhythm section. You have the vocal. And even, so here's the thing about him with their records. Imagine the responsibility of having to make all the musical tones, sounds, parts, melodies, rhythms, arpeggios. The other guys, if they've laid it down. Yeah. Bono's sitting there writing the lyrics, all brilliant. But now, okay, what's gonna make the sound of this record? It's all on you, buddy. Well, and he did all the keyboard parts too. On yeah. top of it. Now, you bring in Daniel Lenoir and Brian yeah. Eno, so, yeah. that they, so they're secret, you know, yeah, secretly part, did. <laughs> parts of the band. But that's the thing that blows me away about him the most. Rock, to me, is a great idea, and it's a simple great idea. That's what people have forgotten today. Jimmy Page, those songs, Back in Black by, you know, um, ACDC. Yeah. Great ideas. Even yeah. All Right Now by Free. Oh, man. Yeah. Just one after another, great, simple ideas. That's where the metal meets the road. <laughs> the, the, right. what, the, yes. The pedal meets the... What, what's yeah, my the name? pedal, the... Whatever that saying is. Right. The rubber meets the, the rubber road. The rubber meets the road. Okay. Oh, yeah, God. So, so that's what I think about. It's like, okay, what are you going to do to make the next U2 record the greatest thing ever? To have that on your shoulders, he did that. He, he did made that. those sounds. He, the high Ebo stuff. The, uh, the delay parts in the choruses, the AC30 beatly parts that are dry and traditional, yeah. the R&B part in uh, one, you know, the song. Oh, it's brilliant. Yeah, so he covered all that. That's what I, I, I think people don't give him credit for the brilliance of that. They yes. just take for granted that it's a great sounding record. Yeah. No, they are brilliant parts. I One of my favorite things to do when I would drive my old Honda Civic around, yeah. my hatchback, is I would listen to records. This is in the early 90s when I was starting to learn about production. And I would, well, I had a speaker that was out. So I would listen to the <clears> records <throat> just with one speaker on until I got it fixed. And then I realized the benefit of, of only listening to one side. And the one side and the Joshua Tree, I believe it was the uh, left side that was out. And in the right side is only chicka, 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 chicka oh. parts. And all the main <clears throat> guitar parts, were, I think it was the left side they were in. And and if you just listen to that record one side at a time, you will hear the brilliance. You'll hear the, the background vocal parts that only happen in that speaker. This is also brilliance of Daniel Lenoir and Brian Eno. Yeah. There's those, those kind of things. But those U2 records, I would never put them on to try and 
see if my mix sounded good because they they sounded so unique that you would never reference a U2 record because they were so unusual sounding. Yeah, and it wasn't so much about the virtuosity of the sound, like a pure Gabriel record. Yes, was different. You, that's audiophile stuff. Which, of course, Daniel Lenoir did the So record yeah, right before right, the Joshua right, Tree. Right, but but you two, you didn't really have to worry about that yeah. with them. It was more the emotional force and the beauty of, you know. I mean, It's a Beautiful Day. I don't know where that came from. Yeah. That might be my all-time favorite U2 recording. And that came late in their career. Yeah. How do you come up? Where does that come from? I mean, it was just, it was brilliant. Brilliant. I became a U2 fan very early on when they when they did the war record. There was, um, other than Sunday Bloody Sunday and songs like that, there was a song called Drowning Man that was on that record that was, is I've mentioned it on the channel before. It's one of, it's a, it's a, just this absolute beautiful melody. And it's in, I, I want to say it's in six, but it has a cello in it and, um, and the edge by that third record if he still wasn't into the heavy delays yet that didn't really happen until unforgettable <clears throat> fire when that you started to see the influence of eno and lenoir when they well when they came into the picture and those beautiful sounds that happened on the unforgettable fire on that particular song or a sort of homecoming songs like that that were these just absolute exploding landscapes of sound and the edge that the whole group does not get its due at this point i don't think and the edge is a genius anybody that says anything else in the comments i'm coming after you he is a uh, he was just an absolute innovator and a brilliant guitar player and is orchestrator one of, orchestrator yeah. and is one of my favorite guitar players Me of too. all time and we used and borrowed and regurgitated and reimagined his guitar playing on record after record after record, and we still do it. Yeah, as do a lot of people. It's he kind of reinvented. Here's the thing: when I first moved to LA, the eighth note guitar part was down low, kink, 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 jank, kink, 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 like the Cars or the Knack yeah. or whatever. Yeah. And then in when it came to heavy rock, it stayed there, but it was <laughs> and then. The Edge was playing the eighth notes, but with the delays, it was ga 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 that triplet the eighth note part. To it. And then yeah. it comes back to Coldplay, and they've taken away some of the delays, and it's just gang 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 with some reverb or the band Phoenix or whatever. A lot of these new kind of rock bands, maybe they just have reverb now, which to me is the greatest joy of life is that I can print reverb 100 percent of the time. Everybody loves it. I love it. Yes. It used to be verboten, you know, no, yeah. reverb, turn your reverb pedal off. We'll add it later if we want to. Yeah. Try, 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 try. Now, reverb, I, I can I can use it 100% of the time. Okay, let me ask you this. How often would you print sounds in the 80s with effects? You would print delay <clears throat> effects, right? Okay, yes. As a tracking musician in L.A., you were supposed to come up and... and <laughs> make an amazing guitar part on the first take you know so right. you pretend I, I almost was able to do that other guys could do that whatever but part Tim of is that, so humble i mean i don't know if you guys realize how humble he never ever he was almost able to do it no tim is he's always able to do it but he he no, he I, is I, unbelievably I, humble. I, I pulled up from behind and I got got those those skills. <laughs> but what it was is is in the eighties on the tracking session, you'd have to the artist would be there. You come up in a song like "I Keep Forgetting" by Michael McDonald, right? Mm -hmm. With that beautiful Lukather part, other parts, a Don Henley record, whatever. You'd show up with your stereo guitar rig, yep, and you would print delays because that sounded. Sort of like the four guitar parts that should be there. See, right. in on in any recording, there should be three or four guitar parts. It's been yeah. that way forever. Yeah. And the way to kind of cheat that and make everybody confident in the first few hours was to have this huge stereo delay thing. That's and why the Bradshaw racks and things exactly. like that became popular. And it, it was pretty hard then because then what do you do with it? Do you pan it down to mono and put it over here? Yeah. Do you start overdubbing? That's yeah. really what, what a yes. lot of people did. Yes. But I did it a lot because as a tracking musician your job was to win immediately yeah and that allowed and you the as a fullness on the that fullness. first take yeah 
when the people hear the song, <clears throat> oh, well, that sounds great. Yeah. Wow, I can totally imagine That's this. why we got kind of stuck there, if I can be just a little bit negative about it. Yeah. We got stuck there for a long time because it was just part of the tracking session. Now, in the 90s, I could go mono and people, they wouldn't mind that the guitar part was not huge because they knew the minute we stopped and I added another one, it would be huge. All it takes is two. Yeah. It just takes one on the left and one on the right and it's big. Yeah. So that came back quickly, but the 80s, there was a lot of, now the British guys make, making records slowly, Yeah, they didn't worry about that stuff. But here in LA where it was kind of a music factory and artists were making records constantly, you would <laughs> come in. So would you call that, I, I mean, I personally, call, mm -hmm. I've always called that additive production where you add parts to make it bigger as opposed to maybe in the 70s, people would play dynamically. They wouldn't have as many tracks to use Yeah, and they would play their parts and and the excitement would become from either hitting a pedal in the chorus or something if they were tracking or playing louder in the choruses. And arguably, the that's the best way to do it. And it keeps coming back to that. Right. It's like you swing into excess, you go off the path, and you go, wait a second, we got to get back to... And that's what happened in the 90s, and that's what's happening now, too. Yeah. And you can hear it on Nashville records, you know. The other thing is, guitars, and these events you're talking about, you talk about the one speaker thing. The way to hear the music that way is on headphones. Yes. You you listen on headphones, you can go, oh, I didn't even hear that guitar part. It's you know, amazing. You know, when you listen on headphones, I always, I never thought about it, but when I would work through studio monitors and you pan things left and right, it sounds normal. You put on headphones, at first it's shocking. Oh, yeah. whoa, that sounds too far over. Yeah. Maybe I should move it back. But yeah. no, then you start listening to other records. Oh yeah, that sounds normal. That's right. So. Yeah. You know, I mean, uh, uh, what you hear on a record if you're driving around yeah. or you're in, you know, at the uh, hardware store and something great comes on, you hear kind of a, a wash, a beautiful mono. wash. Yeah, basically. It's basically yeah. mono. And you, things are favored. You hear the vocal, you hear this stuff happening, but you really have to put headphones on to actually hear the genius of how everything is carefully placed. And Tim was the architect of many of these genius. <laughs> Did a lot of it. Had a lot parts. of help. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, right? Well, Tim, this has been really enlightening. And these are questions that I've wanted to ask you. We've really never talked about right. these specific things. That's and I've, nice. I always wondered about tracking because I didn't start uh, playing and doing recording until about 1989. And, uh, and, and you, but you were recording bands mostly. I was recording bands mostly. Yeah. And you knew you would have to build them up one step at a time, usually. Yeah. And I would usually have to replay their parts. No, just kidding. No, no, no. If you worked with me, you played your own parts. I worked with plenty of producers who would say to me, hey, you mind if I try that? <laughs> ging, ging, ging. And it was always great because everybody has a good feel, you know? It's like, yeah, you do it whatever. Uh, well, Tim, this has been great, and I look yeah, forward to hanging more this week. You're going to see Tim probably in some more of my videos uh, as we go through NAM. And thank you, Tim, so much. Thank you, Rick.